Welcome to our class on Jewish history. The class today is going to be on Chaim Solomon, a patriot of the American Revolution. Almost exclusively um, what we're going to talk about is taken from an article of a good friend who passed away a few years ago. Actually, he's an older person. I knew his family well. His name is Joseph Adler. I grew up with his daughter and he lived around the block. So I, in his memory, we talk about Chaim Solomon. When we talk about the Jews during the American Revolution, how many Jews actually were in the colonies? So actually it's recorded that there were 2,500 Jews that actually lived in the 13 colonies. You're talking about a population of 2.5 million people, probably about a half a million uh, slaves. So the Jewish population was 0.1% of the American population. Most Jews sided with the Patriots, even though they were wealthy Jews, few wealthy Jews, wealthy merchants who were loyalists and remained loyalists. Um, for example, one of the first Jews to die, or people to die during the American Revolution, was a Jew named Francis Salvador. Uh, the Charleston Jews went with the Patriots, and actually when I lived in Charleston, they had a famous picture of, of him being scalped, actually Francis Salvador and the JCC that I uh, worked a little bit in, in South Carolina, Charleston. Other, several other famous Jews, uh, our Colonel Isaac Franks, we'll talk about a little bit him a little bit later. Uh, he was on George Washington's staff. Another famous Franks is Lieutenant Colonel David S. Franks, who actually was the adjunct for Benedict Arnold. He went through a lot of problems all through that. And another famous um, American Jewish patriot is Dr. Philip Moses Russell, who actually was Washington's surgeon, as well as the surgeon that were with the American army in Valley Forge. Uh, Jewish, uh, other areas where Jews worked in were uh, blockade runners, um, they worked in financing and brokers, and that will bring us to Chaim Solomon. We're going to talk about one of the most important financiers of the American Revolution, and that is Chaim Solomon. Chaim Solomon was born in Poland, in the town of Lisa, in 1740. Um, he had no formal education, but he wandered through Europe. And amazingly, he knew several, several languages, actually up to nine languages. They are French, Italian, Polish, Russian, German, Dutch, Hebrew, Yiddish, and later, English. Uh, he came to this country in 1772 when they were petitioning Poland between Russia, Prussia, and Austria. He found that maybe there was no hope and it was necessary to go to the colonies. Uh, he opened up uh, a business on Broad Street in New York City and he was a merchant of sun-dry goods, which are miscellaneous goods. And, but during this time is when the storms of the revolution were happening. Solomon, uh, Chaim Solomon had an inclination towards the Sons of Liberty. I mean, he basically left Poland and wanted to have a life of liberty. So it sort of uh, worked for him. And actually many Jews as well felt that they should side with the, with the uh, Americans or for different words that we use at that particular time. Um, he was uh, recommended to be what's called a sutler, which he sold provisions in General Philip John Schuller's Upper New York uh, State Army uh, during uh, 1776. So most of the summer of 1776, uh, he was helping them with goods and selling goods to the various patriots. Uh, he returned in September of that uh, year in New York City where uh, the British had taken New York. Um, before that, they had left Boston, uh, and there's a whole story of how Washington got them out of Boston. Um, and he returned, as I mentioned, in September to New York City, but there was a plot to send fire to the ships of the British, and uh, they weren't too successful, and he was viewed as a spy, and he was put in a what's called a provost prison, which is basically what to decide with him. And this is important because he'll spend two times in prison, which will deal with Chaim Solomon's health. It had a major effect on him. 
what was his strength that the British saw for him was again this linguistic ability. And, and this is really almost the Jewish story of Jews knowing many languages and being involved in um, interpreting and being go-betweens. So he was put as in a canteen uh, section and part interpreter. Was The purpose was to ease communication between the English and the Hessian uh, higher troops. He was also used and giving more mobility, so he was able to speak with French troops who had come to help uh, the Americans and actually help many of them escape. He also was able to convince Hessians to change their allegiance. Uh, so this was sort of undercover, and, but he was given a reward uh, of freedom for the work that he had done for the British, and he opened up a business uh, which actually sold alcohol and other items. So at this time, um, he was looking for someone to marry, a shidduch. And remember we mentioned uh, Colonel Isaac Franks. He actually marries his sister. Now, it's very fascinating that that was a Spartic family. He had some Spartic origins beforehand coming to Poland, but basically sort of had some of that uh, within his tradition. But actually, it's very fascinating. At this time, Chaim Salem was 37 and Rachel was 15. Interesting enough. Um, the sad point was is that the British also realized that he was still spying for the Americans and he was detained again uh, in uh, prison. Uh, again, at this time, he had his wife and he had a one month year old child at the time. And um, he again escaped again to Philadelphia, and his wife and child stayed in New York at the time. Uh, he actually went to Congress to find, try to find some employment. They weren't able to find employment for him, but what he did was he was able again to open up a business where he sold products as a commission merchant, and he was also able to broker uh, various currencies from various countries that were sort of in the, uh, the colonies at that time, to be able to build a, build a business for himself. Again, being twice in prison, we will see that he will deteriorate and sadly die at a, at a young age. In 1781, um, the Congress decided to set up a Bank of North America and they made their superintendent of finance, Robert Morris, who lived in Philadelphia at the time. Uh, later on, Robert Morris will be known as one of the signers of the Constitution. Uh, and what he did was he hired uh, Chaim Solomon as a broker to negotiate bonds and bills of exchange between France, Holland, and Spain. And the fact was that Solomon was a major success. Uh, he uh, actually beat out the other brokers and might have, might have been, or the reason for that is not only because of his ability to, with languages and, and, and that ability which he received when he was living in Europe, uh, he also had a better change rate. Most of the financiers would do a 5% where he said, no, I'm going to do a quarter of 1% and actually did a tremendous amount of business, even rivaled Morris himself. Uh, at this time, uh, he was able to bring his family and they moved to Front Street, where he was known to be at the coffee house from 12 to 2, except when it was Shabbat in Yom Tov. Actually, uh, Chaim Solomon was an observant Jew. All right, in 1783, we're getting very close to the, the end where the, where the revolution ends. Uh, he asked Robert Morris to be able to extend his business through advertising, and he was able to be very fruitful in his own, in his own business. Uh, and he was able to increase his name to create new business. He also worked as a uh, fiscal agent uh, many times with the French army. And when the British cut off any uh, communication with Europe, so people weren't uh, able, uh, he actually was able to help finance uh, the uh, personal needs of the, of, of the King of Spain, uh, who there was a representative, Don Francisco Rendon. And also that was, he was able to keep the networks of France and Spain together, even though it was extremely difficult during that time, and that actually helped 
in the war as well. Um, again, he was also an agent uh, for war subsidies uh, from France and Holland, and many of the bonds which he put forward, American bonds, were sold in Paris at the Paris Stock Exchange. Um, Chaim was, um, I mentioned he did, was involved in his own private business, but uh, he was involved in many, many cases of commerce, uh, of helping others as well. Uh, many uh, prominent individuals during the American Revolution, uh, members of the Continental Congress, benefited from Solomon's, actually even personal loans, often, often without interest, and they were extended. Uh, many people, um, and actually future presidents as well, uh, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, uh, were helped by Solomon. Um, actually, Madison uh, writes gratefully to his son of the help that he received and the kindness of the Jewish broker who often came to his aid, who refused to take recompense. This was a very important aspect of Solomon, uh, and we'll see later that actually it had a lot to do with him um, basically going penniless. So, there's a story about Chaim Solomon in Yom Kippur. Now again, uh, this is a tradition. Again, he was an observant Jew. Uh, he attended services. Uh, he would not uh, write on the Sabbath. He was very, very meticulous about Jewish observance. And it says that in 1778, while he was living in Philadelphia, um, George Washington, this was always an issue that the military was not, didn't have enough money to provide for the um, soldiers. And there was always a concern that the soldiers might put their arms down and not uh, support uh, the colonies and, and the Union. So uh, a message went, some people even suggested, Washington suggested this, uh, to go to um, Chaim Solomon. And uh, he, the, the, the emissary came to the synagogue on Yom Kippur night and uh, asked Chaim Solomon that they needed $400,000. That's a lot of money now. It was surely a lot of money then. And see how they can help with the funds. And he was able to make, maybe that was one of the Yom Kippur appeals, and basically was able to raise that $400,000. He himself put forward two, two, excuse me, $240,000 uh, himself to make sure that that request would actually uh, come through. Now, like every um, Jewish fellow, or perhaps, who went overseas, and we know this later on in the 19th century and the, in the early 20th century, there were many relatives that stayed back, and there was always a sense of sending money to them. So he was able to, in 1781, he was able to send a thousand pounds uh, to his parents in Poland uh, to help them out. And like anything else, uh, somehow more relatives came out of the woodwork. Oh, I'm mishpacha, I'm family with, with Chaim Solomon, and he was sending money, a lot of money, uh, to those relatives, uh, aunts, uncles, nephews, etc., um, who needed the money, uh, and it became a very big burden upon him himself. Uh, he tried to accommodate also as well uh, these demands for charity for his European re relatives, but eventually with his health beginning to fail, uh, he basically sent back in 1783 that he, is, uh, he can't do this anymore, and henceforth he can only take care of his parents and his wife and children. Chaim Solomon, like many Jews, uh, was concerned about the Jewish community as well as uh, the situation in the colonies. Uh, he was a member of a synagogue, which actually I was able to see last summer, I think it was last, no, the summer before last, uh, Mikveh Israel in Philadelphia. Uh, I was actually be there out there. It's still a community that still, that synagogue is still running in downtown Philadelphia. Uh, he was one of its founding members, and he was known to have given uh, a fourth, one quarter of the, of the building uh, finances towards this community uh, synagogue. It also said that he taught there, so he had some level of Jewish teaching. They was able to teach uh, Torah there at, at, the, uh, at the synagogue. Um, 
He also was deeply concerned about matters within the Jewish community. Uh, for example, in December of 1783, Solomon, with other members of the community, uh, petitioned the councils of censors of Pennsylvania, uh, which actually didn't have technically have a religious test, but required anybody assuming office to take an oath that they believed in the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament. And he was against this. And even though the petition was not heard in 1783, things had changed a few years later, uh, where, of course, there was no religious obligation to accept upon oneself a various form of religion, uh, and that any Jew can actually feel comfortable uh, becoming part of government. So we're really talking about the end of the revolution, um, and really at this time, Chaim Solomon in 1784, he opens up another office in New York, he joins a partnership with someone, but ultimately he dies at age 45 in 1785. He leaves behind a widow and four children. Um, the issue of what caused his death, he had a serious heart ailment. Uh, British prisons uh, back then were not the prisons that they are today. Uh, and you know, there could have been pneumonia, other aspects that affected his heart, and, and for other reasons, maybe pressures as well, uh, maybe during those years, uh, he, he passed away at the age of uh, 45. Uh, there is discussion that family claimed, because he had no money. He basically, uh, he gave his money away, uh, and um, he, he did uh, various um, businesses, and he gave a lot to family, and he also helped with the American Revolution. Uh, so there was issues of whether or not he had loaned money to the government, and there was issues the family was trying to get this money, but ultimately they were not successful. The question really is, did uh, actually the government owe him money or not? So the question is, he did not take uh, advantage of high loans, uh, high interest on, on patriots, etc., and basically the family uh, did not receive any funds at that particular time. So um, that's what happened to his fortune. Now the, the story of Chaim Solomon is, did anybody know about this story? And people during the time knew him, but actually over the years, uh, it, did not, it was not a popular story. And there was movement to have some level of recognition that the Congress should recognize, and it didn't come through. So actually, in, in 1941, December of 1941, uh, the actually Jewish community themselves got together and erected a statue uh, in um, Chicago. And it was erected showing George Washington uh, flanked by Robert Morris and Chaim Solomon. So this was a statue and still there today. Uh, and actually, President Roosevelt, uh, excuse me, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt attended the ceremony, and it was known to him said is that um, I know the two other people, but who is this third guy? Who is this third figure? Um, again, who is Chaim Solomon? Um, fascinating though that uh, Chaim Solomon did get some recognition, and uh, you can actually purchase this stamp for the bicentennial. U.S. Post Office actually put out. Uh, a stamp that was a contribution of the memory of the little Jewish broker. So that came out 200 years after uh, the start of the American Revolution. So this is the story of Chaim Solomon. Um, I'm glad you were able to listen in and um, you enjoy the rest of your day.